so it's important to have access to updated software to stay ahead of the threats. Install and use antivirus software. Follow some simple cautionary rules, and you should have no reason to fear viruses. Don't boot your computer with a strange floppy. Don't download applications from the net unless you're sure they're from a reliable source. And keep a good virus scanning software up and running on your system, and you should be just fine. Can you name a computer virus? A computer virus. Uh, Donatello. There's a new one called Donatello, I'm told. We just heard about it two days ago. Uh, yeah, the word scan. That's a, that's a bit of a virus. NYB or Genesis, or I deal with all of them. Uh, Stealth Boot H virus. Yes, I've dealt with lots and lots of viruses. Colors virus, yes. And the Good Times virus, which was a hoax. Uh, Steve Gotto, I think that's one of the worst ones I've ever come across. In today's computer world, bigger is definitely considered better. New applications continue to add features and functionality. The computers get faster with more RAM and bigger storage capacity. Now, the current rage in the productivity field, office suites are amazing applications that can perform a bewildering variety of tasks. A lot of us use office suites on a daily basis, full-blown applications for word processing, spreadsheets, and the like. Sometimes, though, we should take a step back and look at what we can do with a simple, basic tool. Now, long before the office suite was popular, there was the Works Package. Small and surprisingly powerful, they are without a doubt some of the best values in the software market today. I thought we'd take a look at one of these mighty mites. Claris Works is a mainstay in education and equally popular amongst many home users. When we first open Claris Works, we are asked what type of document we want to work in. And we can see right here the amazing punch that Claris Works packs. Look at this. Word processing, drawing, painting, spreadsheets, database, and communication modules all rolled into one package. This is fantastic. I could probably spend three or four months just playing with this software. Why don't we take a look first, though, at the word processing feature. Now, of course, for most of us, the good old word processor is our most common tool. And the word processor here doesn't really take a second seat to anyone. Let me open a document with a bunch of text in it so I don't have to type away and keep him, make you bored. I'll open the whale report. The start of commercial whaling. Fascinating report. But let's take a look at the tools that we have. We can do all of the formatting things we'd expect in any word processor, selecting font, size of text, that sort of thing. And my favorite features here in the edit menu, under writing tools, yes, it's got things like your spell checker. It's got a thesaurus. It'll count the words. From <laughs> Students love word count. Teacher said I had to write 75 words on this. I got 74. Dad, can I add one somewhere? <laughs> I like that. You can also create custom dictionaries, that sort of thing. But there's also a lot more what we consider sophisticated features. Here in the toolbar, we can make a single column of text into double column for like a newspaper type columns. And the thing that I really like about Clarisworks, one of the real amazing strengths of Clarisworks is its ability to combine document types uh, uh, of, different, of different flavors. Let me show you. I'm going to open our toolbar, and we see here that we've got a bunch of different tools. So we can actually add graphical elements. Let me show you how we bring a graphical element in. Let's say we want to add, for some reason, a circle. I'm just going to draw a circle. I have access to my draw tools, and there I've brought a circle into this document. I can change its color, and I can arrange it. I can look, I can put it to the background here by saying move it to the back under the Arrange menu. And now I've got this nice little circle this graphical circle that I can still modify and move and incorporate into the, into, into the document itself. Look at this little square tool here. This one, this will bring in a spreadsheet right into our word processing document. Watch how this works. I just click and drag, and a little marquee is formed. I release, and look at that. I've got a little spreadsheet uh, just brought right into this document. And all of the menus have now changed to support what it would expect to be supported if I did indeed have a spreadsheet. Look, I can choose my number type here, as you would expect in a spreadsheet, and make the first cell a currency. Now I can type in $32.50, just as I would expect in, in a spreadsheet. Hit enter, and it comes in as dollars. I can do all my calculations. Everything I'd expect in this spreadsheet, I can do right here, but I'm working within the word processor. Now this is an element that kind of rides on top still. See how I can move it around? I can actually embed this into the word processor just by simply cutting it out under the edit menu. 
Now it's sitting on my clipboard. I can select the text tool, set an insertion point into the document. Back under the edit menu, I choose paste. And now the spreadsheet is embedded into the document so that as I add carriage returns or type along, you'll see the spreadsheet will move with me. Really a nice, a nice way of dealing with multiple different types of documents. Now I thought we'd show you how to get the most out of Clarisworks today by creating a little cafe newsletter. Now many of you would think that the word processor here would be a great place to create this newsletter. And you'd be right. We could do a fine job of importing graphics and making our newsletter right here. But I want to show you a slightly different approach. I like to deal with different, different elements individually as objects. And the place that I can do that is in the draw document area. So let's close this and let's create a new document. And I'll show you what a draw document looks like. Draw documents, as I say, deal with elements. Here I have a very similar looking toolbar. I can add text. I can import the spreadsheet. You can do these in, in each and every area. But I can also draw graphical elements like this and move them around. And I can add a circle, for instance. And I can resize and reshape these in any way that I want on a continuing basis I can, until it looks perfect. Now, this works for graphical elements, but it will also work for textual elements and other things. Let's show you that. I've actually created a document which has all the elements, that, or most of the elements that I want for this newsletter. Here's the document here. And here's the elements that I'm going to want to incorporate on the first page of my newsletter. You see I have a little title here. I've got a picture of D. Isn't she looking nice? I've got a little text story. Actually, I snagged that from the commercial whaling story. And I've got a, a list of the different, uh, the different stories that are going to be in this episode of our newsletter, or this issue of our newsletter. But what I need to do first is I need to create a masthead, a graphical introduction that's at the top of a lot of different magazines or newsletters. So I'm going to choose my box tool here so that I can create a nice area here that I can add some color and text to right there at the top. And now I could fill that with a single color, just by, like that. Or if I continue to look along this menu here, I find an area that I can import some gradient fills. Look, I could fill it with this nice bluey thing. Uh, if none of those really turn my crank, if none of the gradient fills here really work for me, I can also go into here. Look at this. Under the Options menu, I can go into Gradients, and I can actually edit the fills. There's the, the menu choices that I have here under Gradient here. And here's the gradient editor. Let's choose this one here. And you can see that I got this nice kind of yellow to uh, orange look. And I can change the direction of that the yellow comes in. Look at that. I can edit that. I can change the colors that are incorporated within this gradient fill. I can do just a, a, a create whatever sort of look I want from that. Now, my, my document here hasn't reflected the change yet because I actually have to go and choose the new fill that I created. And now I've got the fill that I want. Next thing we need to do is we need to add some text to this. And I'm going to call this Dotto's Data Cafe Times. And I can highlight that. And now I'm dealing as if I was in a word processor. I can choose the font that I want. I'll choose Jack Condensed. Make it, say, 36 point. That looks good. I would concentrate it here using the text tools. Now I choose the, uh, the uh, cursor tool and I can position it wherever I want. And this is the nice thing about dealing in an object-oriented environment is I can move things around and resize them in, until it fits just perfectly for me. I, want, I can bring in a graphic. Let me go under my, sorry, under my scrapbook here where I've got, I keep the company logo score, stored. I can copy that. And then I can paste it right into here. And I got the logo there so I can have, add the nice color logo. I can start positioning all of the different elements that I want. Here I've got uh, D as our employee of the month. Here's a list of all of the things that are going to be in this issue. I think, oh, I need to say what's in this issue. Now I could go through all of the font selection process again, or I could just say, I've got all the right fonts and the right size on this in this string of text here. I can just copy this, and I can paste it down again. And now I can take that, take my text tool, highlight it, and change it what it says to in this issue so I don't have to remember all the fonts and go through all that selection process again. Now I can go through and start dressing this out. I'm going to change the font down below here to Jack Condense once again. Uh, make it 18 point. Starting to look like a newsletter. You know what I need is I need some nice rules to, to demark my different areas. I'll choose the line tool 
And down at the bottom of this area, I can choose the size of line that I want to have, the thickness. And now I can start drawing my lines. And this is just about ready to take a look at. I'll just position my text box down here at the bottom where it should go as a description of Dee as employee of the month. I'm sure she's going to be so proud. And I've got the look that I want to have. I think it's time to take a, a quick look at this. I'm going to print it out and it's going to go off to my color printer. Now, works packages are sort of like the Swiss army knives of the computer business. The beauty of works software is that I can do all of this work under essentially one roof. The one thing I really like is the small RAM footprint that works packages use. For instance, this one runs in under a megabyte. Now, in this day and age where we often need a gazillion megabytes of RAM to just boot our computer, it's comforting to find a full featured application that takes up less than a megabyte of space. I think we better see how this newsletter is doing. <laughs> oh, Steve, I'm so honored. Congratulations, Dee. You are our employee of the month. <laughs> I'm the only employee. Technicality. Stay with us. Coming up next on Web World, how to find people online. People. There are lots of free and demo helper programs available on the net to help you add graphics and sound to your homepage. Welcome to Web World. Today I thought we'd spend a little bit of time trying to find people online. Of course, the internet has got just what everybody in the entire world connected to it, but how do we find those people? There's no central directory service that I know of to find people's names and addresses and email addresses and all that sort of stuff online, but we have with us an expert at tracking people down online, Diane Curry of Siberian Networks Incorporated. Siberian Networks Incorporated? Mm -hmm. Good. Diane, thanks for joining us. You teach a course on finding people online. Yes, I do. It's a popular course? Yes, it is. A lot of people want to find... Uh, Want, know that there's so many people out there on the internet, but they want to find out how to get in touch with them. That's right. People are interested. People are very interested. Now, can we find uh, people's personal information, like their phone number, that sort of stuff, as well as their email address? Or, or are internet searches pretty much confined to just their email addresses, their electronic lives, as it were? There actually are complete phone books and directories online that contain their uh, people's address and phone numbers. Now, a lot of people go out and buy these phone discs that have, like, uh, their CD-ROMs that have all of the directory for Canada, the United States, all of the white pages. So that sort of information is available online as well? Yes, it is. Okay, well, shall we search for some? You want to show, you show me how? Well, sure. Let's look at uh, the first one I want show you is called Canada 411. Okay. So let's uh, go take a look at it. We have here Diane's website, which mm -hmm. is a, a page that she, we're going to link to from our website, which contains, uh, and here you contain a kind of a how-to on connecting to people. So all the web addresses that we're going to be looking at today, you can find by visiting this site. So the first one, as you said, is Canada 411. That's this one right here. So we go to it. Okay. And what about this site? Well, as you can see, it's, it's sponsored by a lot of the phone companies mm -hmm. across Canada. Mm -hmm. And it has, it's essentially a phone book online. So let's go try to find someone. Okay, let's find somebody. Let's find somebody that nobody would possibly ever want to find. Let's go and find Jeff Groberman. Uh, he's the producer of the show. You might have met him earlier. Groberman. You got a click. I got a click. Oh, I always forget to click. Thank you. There we go. And we'll put down just his first initial, which is J for Jeff. And is that all I have to do? Well, the more information you know about the person, the easier you're going to find them. Okay. So, so if you know the city they're in or the province, that would certainly help narrow down the search a bit. Oh, okay. So if you're like searching for an old high school buddy and you know they've moved to Ontario, you're going to be okay. you better okay. put Ontario. You better, and yeah. it'll narrow the search a little That's bit more. Right. Well, we, I imagine Jeff's in British Columbia, so let's start the search here. You know, if I find out he doesn't have an address, I might be concerned about working with him in mm -hmm. shows. Oh, there we are. And one of these is going to be our producer, Jeff Groberman, and it's got his address and phone number. Now, what does this, the, the link here, go to? That just goes to more detailed information. Oh, more detailed information. Let's see if we can find any more detailed information on it. This is interesting. Oh, the full address, full mailing address. There you go. I could send him a birthday card. You sure could. I got to find out when his birthday is. Is that online? I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. 
Now, but and, and on the internet, a lot of us are, you know, our physical address is one thing, but our email address is a whole different story because it often bears no relationship to our name at all. Uh, we take all sorts of strange names. How do we go about finding people in that case? Well, again, there's a lot of directory services available mm -hmm. that actually can search for email addresses. Okay, let's go back to your page and you tell me where to go next. Well, the next one I want to show you is called 411. And this is a fairly comprehensive internet white pages. Mm -hmm. And it has people's listings, including their email addresses. Now, where does it get its information from? The information comes from publicly available sources, as well as people go in and register themselves on this service. Now, do a lot of internet service providers automatically send your email address and that sort of stuff to a service like this, or do you have to do it yourself? No, they don't. They, they won't do that. They no. kind of they, they hold that pretty dear, don't That's they? That's right. Yeah. So so if you want to be found online, this is, a, this is a good piece of advice. If you want to be found online, if you know people might be looking for you, you go to a service like this and register and it'll help you be found. Yeah, and you can also register yourself according to the high school you went to or activities you're interested in. So. Oh, so it's within there. That's it, right. It, oh, okay. So who should we search for here? Well, why don't we search for me? Okay. Diane, like many of us, on a lifelong search for herself. So, how have I clicked in there? Yes. Diane Curry. Okay. Now, let, let's not add any other information. Let's say I don't know where you are. You're an old high school that's gone off okay. or somebody. So let's uh, start the search right there and let's see what we come up with. Pretty excited? You nervous? I'm nervous. <laughs> hey, let's, <laughs> let's see where you live in cyberspace. Oh, there's a fair number of Diane Curry's out there. Look at that. Well, it looks like you've got seven matches and actually all of them are me except for the last two. <laughs> You have too many email addresses. I Diane. do, yeah, and a few of them are old, so actually only two of them are still valid. Oh, really? So even when you do a search, it, it might be an ongoing process. Even if you find somebody, their address might not be current. It won't know if it's an obsolete, like it won't know if it's an obsolete uh, or unlisted number, as it were. It won't know. It no. won't know if you've canceled the account That's and right. gone on to another thing. Uh, Diane, thank. You. What about oh, one last thing I want to ask you about is what about people in genealogy, looking people's family up? You know, that's becoming increasingly popular. And in any advice for people? that are out searching for their family tree, that sort of thing? Well, I've actually got a few email messages like that. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as you're polite and you state exactly what it is you're expecting and what kind of information you're looking for, people will be glad to help out. Good stuff. Diane Curry, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you. If you're wondering where to find uh, Diane's page or any of the other information that we cover on the show, here's how to find our website. You can email us at gotto at istar.ca or you can leave a message on our homepage at www.dotto.istar.ca. We'd love to hear from you. That's it for today's show. We hope you've learned a few useful things along the way. Next time on Dotto's Data Cafe, sound cards. The hills are alive. The awesome audio you can hear from your computer with today's new improved sound cards. And I've got the Data Cafe's fax modem set up so we can show you some of the cooler things you can do with faxes. Faxinate rhythm, got me on the go. Faxinate rhythm, a phone you have done. And on Web World, mail lists. What are they and why should you know about them? Mail lists, mail lists, give me your answer. And I'm going crazy. Our tagline for today is from Mark Twain. Get the facts first. You can distort them later. We'll see you next time on Dotto's Data Cafe. You say data, and I say Dotto. You say ditto, and I say data. Data, data, ditto, Dotto. I'm calling the whole thing off. Oh, hey, I found the pepper spray. No, he probably eats the stuff. Well, Lloyd, this has to stop. Stop. A combo tune encore. <laughs> Where'd you come up with this? Dreaming. Serving the people of British Columbia 
This is the Knowledge Network, a broadcast service of the Open Learning Agency. Courses on television from the Open University and the Open College on the Knowledge Network. <laughs> 